Okay. Yes, I can. Right, so it's just the title slide. Yeah. All right. Okay, so we are now recording. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. It is 12 o'clock. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, my name is Lauren Kendall Brooks. I am the current president of uh, Black and Psych. And I am very excited to bring to you all the first of our le lunchtime lecture series. Um, first, we have um, my um, former PI, current, um, my, um, yeah, mentor, um, Dr. Richard Slater <laughs> from the University of Maryland College Park. Sorry, I got so many things happening at the same time. <laughs> I'm trying to let people in yeah. and everything else. Um, but I am very excited to look, to be here for his um, talk slash conversation about building alternatives to whiteness as the default in experimental psychology. Um, so I will let him go ahead and get started. And um, we're gonna save questions till the end. Uh, but if you all do have any questions, drop them in the chat if you need them to remember. Um, and that's about it. I'll let him take it away. All right, thank you. Um, so yeah, uh, since we're doing this over Zoom and you know, um, everyone's dealing with technical issues from time to time, let me know if anything seems a little funny. You should be able to see my slides um, as I've shared screen. So my plan for this um, was be kind of semi discussion or story, I should say, um, rather than just kind of a straight up, here's a bunch of data talk, which I think would be a little less interesting. So um, what I'm talking about today is kind of a bit about where my research has been the last, I guess, couple of years, which I guess is kind of described in the title. Um, but in order to help help everyone kind of make sense of that, I have to very much understand how I got here uh, in the first place. Uh, but of course, I want to start with um, um, acknowledgments. Um, everyone who currently works or used to work in my lab. So that includes uh, Lauren Kendall Brooks, uh, some collaborators, uh, Devin Payne Sturges, who's in public health, um, Cameron Johnson. Um, Natalie is also in public health. She's a graduate student in public health. And Josh Madrano, uh, who works as my graduate student. All right, let's see. All right. So, the way I'm thinking about this, or the kind of the project that I am um, kind of currently working on, or kind of a mix of projects, are kind of quantitative approaches to kind of decentering whiteness as kind of the default and putting something else in the foreground. And what I've kind of been thinking about as what will be in the foreground is kind of participant context. So the journey that I've kind of gone on to get to this point um, starts way back when um, in kind of 1990s Atlanta. So way back then, um, I was kind of just about to get started in um, graduate school, or sorry, in undergrad. Oh, got my time wrong there. Um, and I'm actually kind of a, I think, third generation educator. My grandmother was a teacher and a principal. Other people in my family have taught. So it, it was not unusual for me to have spent a lot of time thinking about learning, children learning. And so when I kind of made my next move after high school um, to college, I discovered this whole area of, you know, what MIT gives it a weird name, they call it brain and cognitive sciences. 
other places just call it psychology or developmental psychology or cognitive psychology. Uh, and I kind of discovered that area where you could do research on kind of like how true to learn, how true to think, things like that. So I kind of dove into that. And my, you know, my original training, I think, was very typical of the time. Um, there wasn't anything particularly interesting about it. I'm reading papers about infant cognition and things like that. At some point, I figured out that some people study math learning. Um, which seemed pretty interesting. And so I got into that and did that for graduate school. So, you know, I move on to uh, University of Wisconsin. And again, I think in the psychology department there, my training was not particularly unusual for a kind of a psychology student at the time. Um, I was in the kind of the cognitive area there. And the one thing I will say that that was a little bit different for me is that my advisor, Martha Ali Bali, was also uh, part of the educational psychology program there. And because she was part of that, we had some connection there and she did kind of push me a little bit to actually spend some time over there. So that the, the building pictured here is actually the, the ed psych building. And, um, what ended up happening is kind of during my longer than I wanted it to be graduate career, uh, spent a little bit of time, particularly towards the end with people in different disciplines in different areas of social sciences. So the, the kind of Center for Education Research at Wisconsin had an IES grant that was meant to have a bunch of people from different disciplines whose work is kind of relevant to education which is kind of an interesting uh, idea and kind of ends up being an interesting mix because you know, I had myself in a psych department, some sociologists who are interested in education, some people from economics, and it ends up being kind of a weird mix because all those different disciplines have their own ideas about what are interesting questions, what kind of level of analysis are interesting and things like that. And really the only, kind of common thing we had was that our interests in some way overlapped with education. So things didn't always go like super smoothly with that. Um, people kind of found it weird that I did experiments um, and things like that. But it was interesting for me because I got to see how what seemed like at first kind of similar questions, kind of how they look from the perspective of other disciplines. So talking to the sociologists and understanding that in some ways what they're interested in is totally different than what I'm interested in. Um, same with people in other disciplines. That was kind of an interesting lesson in trying to think about different ways of kind of viewing the same sorts of problems from different kind of disciplinary perspectives. So, you know, you know eventually I kind of like, you know, learned those lessons, but I wasn't really sure what to actually do with it. And of course, towards the end of grad school, I'm also pretty busy with a lot of practical issues like trying to get a job. Uh, eventually, I ended up getting a postdoc position. Um, and it was after finishing my dissertation, which actually ended up being classroom based. So my dissertation was done in the classroom, which is a little more kind of ed psyche um, than I might have expected going in. Um, and and I, as I kind of transitioned to my postdoc, I ended up kind of uh, fashioning myself in a way that's kind of resembled here and kind of a mix of slightly different approaches uh, to kind of thinking about how children learn about math in kind of early elementary and late elementary also. Um, and so this includes a little bit of like computational modeling. So I did a couple of computational modeling studies uh, during my postdoc was, you know, went relatively well. Some kind of, I guess, standard lab-based developmental psychology work and attempted to include a little bit of neuroscience because I had done some neuroscience um, as an undergrad. I worked in an FRI lab. Uh, I decided I didn't want everyone to do fMRI, but I thought kind of cognuro were kind of interesting ideas. And so I had this, you know, idea that I was going to add EEG into it, um, into the mix. 
Um, and so while I was doing all this uh, and kind of developing, a, you could kind of call it a little bit kind of interdisciplinary in some ways approach, it's still all pretty conventional um, in the sense that the basic assumptions that you see in kind of experimental psych about generalizing over participants um, and thinking about average behavior uh, is still kind of the approach that I was taking for the most. Uh, so I um, ended up trying to, you know, combine those areas, but trying to think more about how I could kind of get away from some of the basic assumptions that I have kind of learned in my training, um, even though I'm going back and forth between, you know, classroom-based studies, lab-based experimental studies, and computational modeling. So, you know, doing all this was really helpful for me in um, kind of creating a research program that, you know, apparently a few people thought was pretty interesting because I did eventually manage to get uh, tenure track job. So I'm at the University of Maryland um, in a college of education uh, in the Department of Human Development and Quantitative Methodology. And, you know, my kind of bouncing back and forth between kind of developmental ed psych and modeling was probably very helpful uh, in kind of getting this kind of position. But um, even as I was kind of going along and having to kind of you know, as part of applying for a job, you have to write this research statement, which is kind of three pages of what you've done and what you plan to do. So you're kind of constantly thinking through what your research program is and how what you're doing is going to be kind of interesting and innovative. And so I'm constantly kind of you know, thinking through that sort of thing and trying to figure out exactly what my research program is going to be and they're reading in areas that weren't really quite my actual research area so when I first started my position in let's say 2014 or so uh, I was actually kind of started reading a lot of sociology books so sociologists tend to write books um, and I read a bunch of those just kind of for fun most of them were about K-12 education, um, kind of slightly different topics. I just kind of pulled these four. It's just kind of different examples of things that I read. Um, a lot of them are relying on qualitative approaches, which I was really not familiar with at that point. So I had really only done kind of typical quantitative, collect some data on how well people do some tasks, put it in an ANOVA and talk about how group one is different than group two, those sorts of things. So I'm reading all these kind of qualitative approaches to thinking about education in kind of different ways. And I'm mostly doing it because at that point, I, um, my son was not quite old enough for kindergarten, but he's about to go into school. And so I'm kind of thinking about this partly just from the perspective of a parent. I'm kind of curious how things work or what the sociologists say about how things work. But it was kind of interesting to read because uh, sociologists are really interested in high level systems, um, kind of in a, which are in some ways kind of very different than what a psychologist with my type of training is interested in, which is a lot of times kind of the individual. So the level of analysis is very different. And even though the topics can seem really similar, like some of these books talked about how well students were doing in classes, um, particularly in math classes, they're not talking about the types of kind of, you know, cognitive tasks, executive function types of things necessarily that some of my training might be doing. They're talking more about the school environment, uh, the parents, the teachers, things like that. So I'm reading all this and also kind of collecting a little bit of stuff in public health that I thought was relevant, particularly work on, um, I guess, social determinants of health. And I don't really have a great story of exactly how it kind of came together in my head. Um, I did find at some point it was useful to 
see what some of the other psychologists were looking at. And some of that came from, I guess, some of the, the social psychologists who, you know, I guess in some ways spent more time very explicitly talking about race than kind of cognitive and, you know, some kind of cognitive development researchers. Now I pulled this quote from a paper. Um, I think this is from 2020, Stephen Roberts um, and colleagues. And they're talking about racial inequality in psychological research and how um, kind of race, which is clearly affects people's experiences and contexts, kind of unsurprising that that has some effect on whatever you could possibly measure as a psychologist, whatever you're interested in, whether it's kind of in a social domain or in a kind of a cognitive domain. So this came out in 2020. Um, I immediately like emailed Stephen up um, and told him I thought his paper was great and I should figure out how to write something that was kind of related to that um, in kind of a cognitive area. Um, and similarly, there's also a paper, I think this is Neil Lewis's uh, paper. And it kind of seemed like psychology, so this is from 2021, um, I was having a little bit of a moment in terms of thinking, I think both in terms of specifically talking about race, but also having these kind of meta-scientific discussions. And I know a lot of the people who are really interested in open science and reform, um, scientific reform and things like that, are having a lot of these discussions that are kind of meta-scientific discussions about how psych psychologists do their work. So I thought that these, all these things were kind of coming together very nicely. And I was kind of seeing similar concerns in other fields. It doesn't work out the exact same way in every field, but I started to try to read papers in fields very different than my own. So public health, black psychology, cultural psychology, which is different than cross-cultural psychology um, and cognitive aging. And it seemed like there were a lot of, you know, somewhat similar concerns being worked out in these different areas. And so I kind of felt that there was definitely something there to be figured out. And so the last kind of couple of years, I've been trying to work on that. And what I've kind of narrowed it down to in terms of a question to be answered or addressed is how to bring participants context to the forefront of experimental psychology and not just their behavior on some task that a researcher made that the person is gonna do for 30 minutes or so. So we spend a lot of time thinking about how we can characterize how people do our task, whether it's math or language or whatever, but in a lot of cognitive and you know some other experimental psych areas, we don't spend that much time knowing who the participants are, um, getting information about their background at all. It varies between areas. Some areas are, there's a little bit more of a tradition of that, um, particularly in some areas of development. Um, but overall, there doesn't seem to be a lot of focus on participants' context. So that kind of, I ended up writing a paper on that. Um, and I'll just kind of go over some of the high level stuff from that paper. This is actually still a preprint. I haven't quite figured out how to get a specific journal to actually publish it yet. But I kind of came up with some kind of what I think are kind of interrelated problems in a lot of cognitive work. A lot of the arguing with the reviewers are that um, everyone thinks that their area is kind of typical of psychology. Um, you know, kind of myself included. And so there's a lot of arguing about, well, what do you actually see in kind of cognitive psych or experimental psych? So I came up with a, a few kind of interrelated problems that I, you know, roughly kind of think of as kind of a, the status quo of kind of whiteness as default. Um, and I think kind of any approach which doesn't examine context of the participants is essentially kind of whiteness as default. 
Um, so one is, you know, reliance on homogenous participant samples, especially when trying to generalize behavior to uh, real world contexts. Uh, a lot of people have written about that, about how, you know, many of us researchers have samples that are largely from our Psych 101 pools or are, you know, mostly high SES white samples. Um, so that's kind of like a, you know, well-covered problem. Uh, second one is this focus on controlling for or ignoring extraneous variables. So I think this is kind of a real conceptual issue where this idea that there's this default person that we can kind of estimate by kind of controlling for things that we think like shouldn't count um, in some way. And so this is where people talking about like controlling for race comes in and there's kind of a lot of pushback about this idea of controlling for race or any other um, sorts of thing. So this kind of gets to the number three was just this assumption of like a generic human actor. Like there's this idea that there is some human cognition that is kind of the way it works, quote, normally or typically that I can figure out. And then if I just collect a bunch of participants and who cares who they are, average across them, I can figure out what that is. Um, and there's no, there's less focus on individual variation and variation in context and experiences. So the paper goes into you know, far more detail, it's gonna be long. Um, but um, I kind of give some really high level uh, recommendations. One is trying to find a way to focus on integrating variation across humans in your participant samples. Uh, the second is to, regardless of, your, of what your sample is, to consider human behavior in context. I know context can mean a lot of things, which I like that way. Um, not everyone's gonna focus on the same aspect of the context, but I think having a focus on, okay, what part of context might matter for this particular thing is useful. Uh, incorporating multiple levels of analysis and kind of non-cognitive factors. So the kind of standard level analysis, I think for a lot of experimental psych researchers is looking at the individual behaving um, on some task that is right in front of them right there. There's other things to look at, whether it's going kind of quote up and looking at the social systems they are embedded in, um, either kind of like real time or kind of previously, or even kind of going down in the level analysis, which I think some researchers in kind of like a dynamic systems approach um, to talk about, because they like to frame things as being about perceptual systems and things like that. Um, so I think the trying to hop between different levels analysis in a, in a given study uh, could potentially be very beneficial. Fourth thing is focus not only on like average behavior, but variation across different individuals and in different contexts or individuals in different contexts. So getting away from this idea that there's going to be this kind of default average that you can define and talk about as like, this is how people are and more talk about it as a distribution. These are the range of behaviors we see. And this is, these are the reasons why the behavior might vary a little bit. And so the, you know, the overall um, kind of recommendation here, which is kind of broad and will take some time, is to create these kind of theories of human cognition that integrate both kind of the way we think about cognition as being about behavior or a certain level of analysis and the broader context that people are always in, right? There's no way to talk about humans as being kind of contextless, as being kind of operating in this uh, vacuum. Like that never happens. There's no kind of ideal human state to be talked about. Um, we're always in some sort of context. So in order to attempt to begin doing that, um, I've been working on a couple of different projects, basically trying to figure out, well, how would I actually do that in my own work? Because um, prior to that, I really had. So 
in thinking about trying to put participant context and behavior on equal footing, partly what I've been trying to do is thinking about what are the measurements that we have about participants' context and how can we evaluate them, at least in a quantitative way, so we can think about context in as kind of complex a way as we also think about their behavior. Um, and thinking about kind of what sorts of measures might kind of count as context or what sort of information might be useful for me to have. Um, it's very, you know, it's tricky to figure out how to actually do this, because in theory, I would like to know everything about all my participants, but that is impossible. Um, and so the researcher does have to kind of make some decisions about what that's going to be, what information they would even try to get um, if they could. So the goal here in the framework that I'm trying to work on, the context space framework, is to eliminate the idea of like white participants as the default. Um, and we're using both qualitative and quantitative approaches in thinking about that. The reason why I kind of focus on talking about the quantitative approach is that I think that's the aspect here that is new. A lot of the qualitative ideas that we've been doing are stuff that are actually already done in other areas. And we're just kind of integrating that into what we're doing. So some of the qualitative approaches are things like uh, participatory research, where you have a lot of kind of like co-design of the actual study between the researchers and the participants. That's more common in some other areas. I've talked with some people in public health who do that sort of thing. I think it could be really useful for people who are interested in kind of experimental psychology um, and cognition in general. Um, I do think that there are a couple other approaches or frameworks that are really relevant um, and related to what I want to do. So you probably know uh, Bronfenbrenner and maybe PVEST. Um, I don't remember exactly what it stands for. Lauren will have to remind me the whole thing. It's like phenomenological. Phenomenological variant <laughs> ecological systems theory. Right. So it's it's like, I don't know if you call it like a sequel to Bronfenbrenner or like a, a, a improvement 2.0 maybe. Um, so those are some things that I, you know, I've kind of become aware of and thinking about. I also put here kind of neural manifolds, which seems kind of um, outside, um, a little outside of this. But I, what I thought was really interesting is that even in other areas that seem totally unrelated, like uh, kind of neurobiology, um, there is this idea of uh, trying to use a kind of a quantitative approach to describe these really com complex contexts. And, and sometimes the, the context is like, you know, all this information about uh, where the neurons are, which ones are firing and when exactly how and things like that. And so some of the methods that researchers in some of these neuroscience areas use I think can be kind of adapted to our kind of more social behavioral um, problems. So the, the context break space framework is kind of an attempt to do that. Um, I like to think of it as kind of this like landscape where every participant in your study could be somewhere on this landscape in terms of what their overall context is. And particularly as a person who does developmental work, you gotta also know that their context can change over time, right? So if you think about work we do of kids in schools, uh, the situation that the, the children are in can vary from year to year, they can change schools and things like that. And so we kind of want some way of defining where they are at. If you have a bunch of participants who come in to do your study, whatever it's about, how do you have any idea how similar or different they are to each other in terms of their overall context? Um, of course, if you don't collect any data on that, then you have no idea. But if you do try to find some data collect on that, you at least have a chance of thinking about how to relate the different participants to each other. So originally we wanted to do this ourselves, collect some new data, um, looking at math, cognition for children, which is what I'm interested in. 
and trying to collect a bunch of data about kind of who they are and what their contacts are. That's been going a little slow, partly due to COVID. So we don't have a huge, amazing data set quite yet. Um, Cameron's still working on it. But um, fortunately for us, there are some existing data sets that we can take a look at. And so what I've been working on is finding some data sets, mostly kind of in the uh, education space that combine both kind of comprehensive data about how people are behaving on what I would kind of think of as cognitive measures like math and a lot of data about who they are and what context their kind of context is. And so this graph that I put up here is something I created where we took a ton of participants, something in the hundreds, I don't think quite a thousand. Um, and what we did is it's color coded based on their performance on a kind of cognitive math assessment. So I think the participants who are in kind of the darker red had a higher score on this math assessment and darker blue kind of had a lower score on it. And you can see them all kind of plotted here on this 3D space. So what we've done is I've sorted through a lot of the measures that they collected in this study. So this is actually from the TIMS study um, and kind of categorized a lot of it as kind of contextual information. So it's not the participants behavior, it's just kind of something about them. Um, and they collected a lot of data. It almost kind of feels like the census in terms of asking a lot of questions about where they live, who their parents, parent education levels, all those sorts of things. And basically the way I'm thinking about it is you can kind of use that as like high dimensional data set where all the participants exist in this space and some of them are very similar. So they're very close to each other in this space and some of them are very far apart in this space. You can't really visualize high dimensional data in all the dimensions. Um, you just kind of have to imagine that it could be high dimensional. But in order to plot it, I can kind of um, use these kind of dimension reduction algorithms that are common in a lot of areas to reduce it down to three. And so I can plot it here. And so basically the idea here is the, the data points that are closer to each other have really, really similar answers on all the contextual information. And the data points that are further away from each other have dissimilar points. And so you can kind of see here it kind of seems to cluster a little bit. You see a lot of the red in one area of the plot um, and less so in other areas. And so what we're working on trying to do is can we show this relationship between where they are in context and their behavior? What other kind of analysis can we do when we are able to kind of talk about their context in this kind of multifaceted way and not just say we subdivided them by race or by gender or something like that. Like we can bring in multiple measures all together and kind of in a quantitative way account for all of them simultaneously. Is, at least it's an attempt to. Um, so I kind of think about this and then I'll try to pull up the paper reference to it soon as an attempt at kind of a quantitative approach that is in line with intersectionality. Um, there's a couple of papers that I would highly recommend that are kind of on that in general and how one can do that. Um, but this is kind of my initial attempt at trying to do that. So we're taking these kind of context and task rich data sets, trying to create the context space that the participants are in there are a couple of different approaches you can use for that. So dimension reduction, which is what I showed you where we reduce all the three dimensions. Um, you can sometimes still do the math in the high dimensional space. It's just difficult to kind of graph it. Um, and you can also think about weighting the different dimensions differently. So I'm just relying on the different kinds of questions that they asked in this study. I didn't make the decisions about it, but you can imagine I'm, could decide maybe I think some things are more important than others or more relevant to these sorts of questions. And I can kind of weight the dimensions differently. 
So the project that we're kind of currently working on is going to kind of combine kind of qualitative approaches that I mentioned before, like participatory design and kind of co-design with this kind of quantitative approach. So we still have in some, in some ways kind of similar data that we would have in a traditional study and that participants are doing these cognitive tasks that we think are interesting or informative, but we're collecting just like a lot more other data that isn't about their behavior per se. And we're trying to integrate it all into our analysis together rather than just kind of talking about it separately saying, you know, this is how the boys did on math and this is how the girls did in math. We're trying to talk about it in a much more intricate way than that. So that's kind of ongoing right now, um, but there are a lot of kind of really kind of open big questions to consider. Um, how to balance collecting a lot of context data with study constraints. Um, you're gonna have a limited amount of time with participants. Uh, you may not be able to collect you know, as much as you want. One strategy that we've had uh, with a lot of our um, child participants is that a lot of this information we ask the parents. So while the child is doing the study and we're measuring behavior from the child, we can get information from the parents about sometimes about you know their context that is useful. Um, but for like recommendations for other researchers who you know, like may not be interested in math, parents um, as interested in math as I am. Um, how do you kind of figure this out for you? What aspects of the participant context are most relevant for your work? I would really encourage people to basically just ask. Um, so we, we, I feel like we learned a lot by just talking to our participants. Um, you know, we kind of went through what we wanted to, to ask them about, the kind of math we wanted to do with the, the children, and got a lot of really interesting feedback from them, both in terms of the actual design of the um, items where we're asking them about math and just kind of thinking about what do they think is relevant to how they're doing in school, doing their math. So this kind of uh, kind of mixed approach, uh, kind of qualitative and quantitative approaches, I think has a lot of potential. It's commonly used in other areas, but I don't know if it's super common and kind of cognitive in some areas of experimental psych. Now, one kind of big issue um, maybe to end on this kind of like open-ended um, question that may be difficult to solve. If everyone starts doing this um, and collecting all this kind of, you know, contextual data for a quantitative analysis, we're going to have different participant samples. Not everyone's having participants in the same context and not everyone's going to ask the same questions of the participants. So how in the world do we um, kind of integrate, how do we compare two different studies when even if we're asking the same questions about math or something like that, we ask totally different questions about context and maybe that's because we're in different countries and they're really different things that we think kind of matter. It's not like there's some like standardized set of contextual questions to ask. Uh, fortunately, there are some, you know, really smart kind of quantitative psychologists working on this sort of thing where they've come up with ways of kind of integrating data across multiple studies where the studies aren't quite doing the exact same thing. It's called integrative data analysis. I'm currently working on trying to totally understand it, but think of it as somewhat similar to ML analysis, but a little bit more complicated because you really do take all the data from the different studies and kind of put it together, so to speak. And so you'll have some overlap in the measures, but some things that don't overlap in the measures. Um, so I can try to find the links to, to those researchers, but I think there are ways going forward of being able to have a situation where all the researchers are not necessarily doing the exact same thing. We have very different participant groups, different samples, but we're still able to kind of come through in the back end and say, how can we take all of our different studies, put them together and understand what's kind of the same across our studies and what is different in terms of who the participants are and what they are doing. Um, I do want to kind of end on a recent um, paper, by recent I mean like a couple of weeks ago. Um, I wrote with a bunch of people um, all listed here. This is the largest number of people I've ever had on a paper that I've done. Um, so thank you to everyone who was involved in that. 
Um, we wrote a little bit more, and this was just kind of a, a letter to cognitive science um, about these sorts of issues um, from the perspective of someone who's kind of worked in cognitive science. Um, so I highly recommend it. Um, it just came out. And um, I'll end with a quote from it, which is my favorite. Um, no group of people's cognition should be relegated to kind of an interesting exception just because their culture or nation state is not currently dominating the scientific research enterprise. Um, and with that, I'll leave you with some papers that I like um, and a link to my lab website where I have more of them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, really great and so much information. I feel like this is such an interesting um, topic as we try to continue uh, with the supposed transformations and conversations that have started in the last few years. And I hope to have continue. Um, so if there's any questions or just comments that anybody has, feel free to unmute yourself and bring them up. Well, you know, sometimes you just give the people what they want and <laughs> they might not have anything else to add. Um, so again, um, I thank you so much for coming out today. Um, also want to give a quick announcement. We are going to have a Black and Psych social um, on July 7th at 7 p.m. You'll start seeing our advertising for that um, in the next few days. And that'll be fun, just a way to get to know people. Um, we are inviting anybody um, interested in psychology, interests or current psychologists. It is a whole gamut, whatever um, part you are in your psychological career, that's what we're here for. Um, so please look, be on the lookout for that. Follow us at um, Black and Psych on Twitter, Instagram, or blackinsight.org to find out more information. And again, if you have any questions, uh, please send us out an email or um, anything else. I And I think that's it, you know, almost 1245. Um, lunchtime is almost over. <laughs> so thank you all. And this will also be recorded. Um, this is also recorded. So it'll be on our YouTube page in the next uh, day or two. So thank you. Thanks everyone.